So there's a slight typo in the schedule. I'm supposed to have scare quotes around open borders, not critics, because they do exist. Hans's open borders critics do exist. The reason I have scare quotes around open borders is because some of the most virulent advocates of this policy, who shall remain nameless uh, in the tradition of Mr. Boggess earlier, uh, actually said, well, uh, yeah, I'm for open borders, complete and open borders. Well, except, of course, for safety, health, and criminal background checks. Well, let's ask ourselves a question. What about tens of millions, potentially billions of people coming to America, as an example, I'm American, that's my frame of reference, unannounced? Where's the database for these criminal background checks of tens of millions or billions of people? What's the health and safety check? Do they come to intake centers at airports or, or highways? And, and are they held there? And are they required to stay and, and take a health check, maybe a blood draw, maybe a cavity search? How long are they held? Is there a barbed wire in this detention center while they're being held for background and safety and health checks? That's a strange kind of liberalism to me, but that's what the open borders people actually have advocated for. Believe it or not, it has been 30 years, 1995, since Professor Hoppe published Free Immigration and Forced Integration. You might be surprised here in Chronicles Magazine. And it's been almost 25 years since the publication of the case for free trade and restricted immigration in the journal Libertarian Studies in 1998. So of course, in the ensuing decades, the issue has only become more acute. Uh, uh, globally, Millions and millions of immigrants have migrated from the global south to the global north, from the global east to the global west. And of course, this is causing all kinds of dislocations and problems. And we find ourselves today with some politicians in the west even tepidly putting their foot into the uh, re-migration camp, which is, I think, a very interesting term. Deportation, re-migration. We weren't hearing that uh, perhaps even five or ten years ago. So I know some of you, you don't have to admit it, went through a Randian phase when you were younger. Uh, I did. And you might remember the old objectivist dictum, uh, check your premises, right? Check your premises. So meaning when you find a contradiction, something's wrong in your chain of reasoning. So if one of your foundational beliefs is false. And so we have to ask open borders advocates a very important question. Why does a purportedly liberal policy greater freedom of movement across the globe actually result and cause Western nations swamped by immigrants to become more illiberal? How can granting greater freedom diminish freedom in those recipient nations? Why does greater tolerance for foreign people's languages, religions, cultures, customs actually result, make nations less tolerant of their own founding stock people? Well, these are contradictions. We have to check our premises. These contradictions have to be explained. So I'll advance two explanations to answer them. Although I would add that the burden of proof, in my opinion, lies heavily on the advocates of open borders, which is an absolutely radical departure from human nature and from human history. But I'll take the, the burden of proof today. First, open borders is actually a policy in search of a principle. And in fact, no liberal principle requires such a policy. Correctly understood in the context of what we might call, well, first of all, property rights, private property, but also organic nationhood, and of course, centuries of state interference with both. There can't be a right to movement when it conflicts with other people's rights. Second, all the highly touted economic, social, and cultural benefits, in other words, the argument for pragmatism that supposedly accrue to the host nations cannot be measured coherently, cannot be proven against the many and obvious trade-offs open borders advocates often choose to ignore. And this, as Professor Hoppe has explained, is because well-being is enormously subjective. It cannot be presented as an aggregate, economic or otherwise. The, the, of course, the fundamental responsibility of social scientists, especially economists, is to help us see the unseen. But when it comes to open borders, they seem to deny themselves this burden, right? We only hear about 
the benefits, never the trade-offs. And I would argue that these trade-offs may in fact be enormously understated. So I mentioned the case for free trade and restricted immigration. An article by Hans Hoppe you should look up if you haven't had a chance to read his Journal of Libertarian Studies, later became a chapter in Democracy, the God that Failed. Uh, to me, that was such an important article because it reminds us that human beings are human beings. They cannot be owned. They have volition. They have agency. They have will. They can be good or bad. They have those characteristics. Whereas goods, goods are inanimate objects. They're owned. They're invited. Somebody owns those imported goods. Somebody's responsible for them. And somebody's going to pay the full cost if they're ultimately not sold or abandoned. This is a hugely important distinction. And it's important for our purposes because it corrects the old Mises and Rothbard treatment of simply analogizing immigration restriction from a purely economic perspective, like trade protectionism for goods. Well, human beings aren't goods. And we have to understand that. Human beings aren't the same, and human beings are not equal. And since that time, since Hans's article came out in the late 1990s, I mean, the digital world has exploded. So it's just exponentially easier today than ever for people to remain where they live and avail themselves of markets for their goods or services around the globe without moving to those markets. So after a couple of different Hans Hoppe articles in the late 1990s, this set off a firestorm in libertarian and Austrian circles, and of course led to virulent outbreaks of what we call hopophobia. Some of you have heard this term. Uh, it was first coined by the late Murray Rothbard way back in 1990, believe it or not. And of course we all know from, from our own experiences what happens when hopophobia is left untreated. Uh, it, it's it's uh, formed some nasty strains. But uh, today, thanks to proper treatment, proper arguments, it's really somewhat isolated. Uh, to a small cadre of noisy left libertarians, many of whom are, I would say, cosseted academics with sinecures, Hayekian think tankers of various stripes who orbit around the edges of the Beltway or Brussels in search of respectability. Uh, and some of them, I might add, are quite literally paid uh, a sinecure, a nice salary, to re essentially reverse engineer arguments for open borders, starting with the premise that we should have open borders and then figuring out how to argue it in reverse. Uh, th there are people who literally do this all day long and are paid to do so. And I've had some encounters with a few of them. Um, Hopophobia is, is not catching, though. Uh, so a few years ago, Gene Epstein, some of you will know that name, he runs the Soho Forum debate in New York City. He emailed me and asked whether I would accept the negative in a debate at the Soho Forum along the lines of something like this. Open borders is the only consistent and principled libertarian immigration policy. So I thought about that and I said, yeah, sure, I'll do that. And then as these things happen, there were some emails back and forth, some phone calls back and forth, and the uh, debate title kept changing. The proposition kept changing. So instead of just it's the only consistent libertarian position, it became open borders is something essential to human flourishing, get a little more vague there, open borders benefits both the host, both the host nation and the immigrant and so forth. So it kept kind of changing, but I said, sure, Gene, because I really wanted an opportunity to revisit and maybe put my own spin on some of the hoppy and arguments against open borders. So I accepted. And my debate opponent was to be uh, the George Mason economics professor, Brian Kaplan. And some of you know his name. Uh, he's f fairly famous in Masonite Austrian circles and is, is known as a big advocate of open borders and has uh, published books on this. And so that made me very happy because his name would potentially give the debate some recognition and also because he is the archetype, in my opinion, of what Rothbard would term a Luftmensch. He is a, a person of the air uh, in the sense that I think he is he's perhaps profoundly brilliant in his own way but in many ways useless and impractical. And in my opinion, of course, to the extent the Masonomics people are promoting open borders, they're actually doing active harm rather than just sort of wasting other people's time and money. And it, to prepare for the debate, I went through and read the aforementioned Hoppe articles, but I also 
uh, read a lot of the old uh, Journal of Libertarian Studies, the back and forth uh, between Hans Hoppe, uh, Stefan Kinsella, um, Walter Block was involved in a lot of those articles. Anthony Gregory was involved in a lot of those articles. And of course, I read uh, some of the, the Cato and George Mason critiques of immigration restriction to prepare myself. And I especially paid attention to Brian Kaplan's cartoon book, it's just called Open Borders, where he insists, among other things, that immigrants don't change the political culture of a place. And of course, we know that this is absolute nonsense. And, and left progressives will, will demonstrate this them, themselves when, in a purely domestic setting. They will talk about how bad gentrification is changing a place. I was watching a PBS, the public government broadcasting show in the United States about San Francisco. And there was a heavily Mexican area of San Francisco called the Mission District, which had been very, because it has Mexicans, that qualifies as colorful. Any place that's white is colorless, I guess. And so, uh, but because San Francisco is becoming so expensive, a lot of white techies moved into the Mission District and raised rents. And a lot of the older Mexican working class folks were pushed out. And I was watching the show, and every argument they made was exactly the argument that right wingers make about immigration into a country. Well, they're changing the culture, and they're driving up prices, and they're taking our jobs. And it's just funny how situational the left would be. Uh, so anyway, reading Brian Kaplan's cartoon book, I, I came away not only unpersuaded by the open borders arguments, actually somewhat offended by the disingenuousness of some of the arguments that gloss over, ignore, or, or sometimes actually tout as benefits the very thing that the existing populations who oppose a mass immigration worry about. And we've been seeing a lot of this, for example, in the UK recently with some of the uh, protests over there, uh, following some murders of some, of some young children, by, uh, allegedly by immigrants. But what's interesting to me is that you have all these citizen worries and the open borders people tell us, well, you know, immigration is so great and the benefits are so obvious. We never seem to get to vote on it, don't we? They like to give that veneer of respectability, that gloss of voting. You know, Donald Trump won the vote, Kamala Harris won the vote, but we never vote on immigration. And why is that? Well, I think we know why. Because if we would and could, we'd all vote no. Mass immigration is uniformly unpopular in the West, apart from, let's say, the Masonomics laptop class. So why this contradiction? Well, we'll start quickly with this argument from principle that liberalism requires open borders, free and unrestricted movement is a natural right well, I think we have to distinguish between the right to leave a place and the right to enter a place. We all have a natural right to leave a place. We all understand that we own our physical bodies. Once we reach a certain age of maturity, we ought to be able to leave, let's say, our parents' home. And as a matter of fact, in common law, there's a tort developed over many centuries called false imprisonment. We all have the right not to be falsely imprisoned or enslaved. But the right to enter a place, well, that's very, very different. Uh, that's circumstantial, right? Um, there's no liberal principle that allows trespassing. There's no liberal pr principle that allows the use of other people's land or living off other people's taxes or free riding off of resources provided by other taxes, even dead people or indeterminate other people's taxes. There is a nexus of history of state intervention which overlays property rights and, and all of the reliance that we all have every day on the state apparatus, which is roads, hospitals, you name it. I would argue that the right to leave a place versus the right to enter a place is the difference, or it, it could be analogized to the right between negative and positive rights. We all have a negative right not to be falsely imprisoned. But we don't have a positive right to go wherever we want. It depends. And after all, we're talking about seeking a theory of justice here. So distinguishing property rights or an approximation of valid property rights or ownership, however imperfect, is our goal. Right? So when we talk about land in long settled areas, it's not unowned simply because the government has come along and decided to control it. Well, contra Walter Block, it is not unowned at all. It is owned as best we can determine in an imperfect setting by the people who paid for it. And that brings us to Hoppe's net taxpayer argument. It is the best approximation 
for justice. We don't abandon a theory of legitimate property ownership just because it's difficult to analyze the claims. We still attempt to analyze the claims. So Walter's blocks let the bums homestead the library. Uh, we, we, can, we can take this argument and use a real world example. In the 2020 riots, which roiled across America after the George Floyd killing, uh, a bunch of bums took over an entire neighborhood, a somewhat fancy gentrifying neighborhood in Seattle called Capitol Hill. And they named it the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, CHAZ. And they shut it down. And they put roadblocks and they had their own, uh, shall we say, um, anti-Hopian, anti-covenant community uh, within uh, CHAZ for several months while the mayor just stood by and said, well, it's a protest, you know. So the question becomes, are they legitimate Lockean homesteaders of this neighborhood, according to Walter Block? Or are they bums and squatters? Well, I would argue that they're bums and squatters. They're sitting on land, even the public land, so-called, that should be managed on behalf of taxpayers by trustees and government as a matter of simple justice because those taxpayers paid for it. So the essence of ownership, we might say, and Walter Block might say, is control. And so gee whiz, these squatters had control of the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. And after all, isn't possession nine-tenths of the law? Well, for our purposes, no, it isn't. The validity of their claim is not determined by possession. You have a densely populated area like Seattle, a long history of property titles flowing from valid sales. The question becomes absurd. So that the encampments on the streets, the protests, they directly injure the private property rights, which are still undisputed all around them, the condos, the homes involved. Uh, the Seattle government has thoroughly controlled all of this for years. And as a result of that, the Capitol Hill residents, the owners, they rely and depend on an existing nexus of understandings and contractual relationships. Seattle can't just be homesteaded. Not even city property in Seattle can be homesteaded in any conceivable manner that does justice to the current inhabitants and perhaps even the dead taxpayers who've paid for it all along. So their right to evict the Chaz protesters certainly and clearly supersedes any right to occupy. So there's a clash of rights, a contradiction, property ownership versus free movement and occupation. I would argue that the latter does not trump the former under a proper theory of justice simply because government has come along and distorted the history of valid and invalid titles. But the argument from principle, this idea that there's a right naturally to free movement, is not the only argument that the open borders people make, needless to say. They make an argument from practicality. They say, well, everyone benefits. It makes people richer, right? Just like prohibitions on the free flow of goods makes, creates inefficiencies and makes us poor, prohibitions on the free movement of people does the same thing. Well, is that correct? We take Capitol Hill as an example of, let's say, a micronation, and we can go out in concentric circles into larger nations, and we can say just naturally, human beings have an innate and natural desire to want to live in what we might call a good neighborhood, for lack of better terms. And that neighborhood could be as small as a couple blocks. It could be all of Liechtenstein, whatever it might be. But the idea that we would never get together collectively and try to control or have any say over property near us, which we didn't actually own, is absurd. Of course we would try to do that. That's what HOAs attempt to do each and every day. And I would hope that a fair number of people in this room anyway understand that there's a difference between nature, nation and state. That nations can be organic. That borders can be organic. They can satisfy innately human desires for order and separation. Borders arise and exist naturally and have throughout history without being created necessarily or enforced by political entities. We can ask Mises about it. He says a nation is an organic entity which can be neither increased nor reduced by changes in states. Mises talked about a liberal nationalism. That means a nation that has laissez-faire at home, free trade abroad to avoid the problems of autarky and Lebensraum, and of course, peaceful relations 
to avoid the problems of war. This is a liberal nation. What's it organized around? Well, according to Mises, it's often linguistic. But it could also be racial, political, ethnic. Right? And he worried very much about the idea of linguistic or other minorities forced to live under an aggressive or hostile government. He said, two or more nations, properly understood, cannot peacefully coexist under a unitary democratic government. And so when we consider it Mises' form of nationhood, mass migration can and should be seen as an injury to these organic nations, as a denial of self-determination. If we accept Mises' nationality principle, the supposedly natural right of millions of, let's say, North Africans to move into Ireland and radically transform it, that's no more legitimate than my right to go live among some Amazonian tribe and insist that they uh, take up iPhones and Diet Coke to satisfy me. I don't have a right to do that. And the irony, of course, is that the self-styled classical liberals, the Hayekians, who overwhelmingly support or insist on this freedom of travel or freedom of movement, also hate the concept of the nation, the idea of an organic nation. They hate it. They're not anarchists. They support the state, but not the nation. They get things exactly backwards in that sense, and in my view, distort Mises. They say, well, national borders are just imaginary lines. Nations are these outdated historical constructs. Immigration restrictions are, of course, per se illiberal. And why should the random circumstances of one's birth have any effect on legal rights or geographical advantages? So what the open borders people give us is a very strange liberalism. It's one where states exist, but state borders do not, where citizenship flows from mere physical presence, where state services and state property, so-called, are equally available to all comers, where humans are likened to physical goods, corporeal goods, and where negative externalities are rendered inapplicable, brushed aside. It's a contradiction. They claim, of course, that Mises supports their thesis of open borders. You can read Ben Powell's article titled Mises' Immigration Conundrum to disabuse yourself of that. As a matter of fact, Ben Powell supports open borders, but admits that Mises understood when immigration restrictions might be necessary for the aforementioned cause of organic nationhood. In the minutes I have remaining, I want to talk about the benefits of diversity, which we hear about quite a bit. Now, when I mention diversity, what comes to mind in terms of a successful country that, is, that, that, that employs that, that has diverse cultures, maybe ethnic diversity. Well, you might think about Singapore, right? You might think about Dubai. Both of those are successful countries, quite diverse. I would add that both of them employ very authoritarian criminal and regulatory structures that our Hayekian friends would not approve of, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, Hayekians don't have um, you know, pictures of, of Lee Kuan Yew hanging over their desk while they're uh, working in the think tank all day. But you might think of Canada, you might think of the USA, you might think of the UK or France or Sweden as examples of diversity, diverse countries. Well, yeah, hey, Jeff, things pretty much work. That's not so bad. Let me, let me tell you quickly the 10 most diverse countries in the world. Uganda, Liberia, Madagascar, Democratic Republic of Congo, Republic of the Congo, Cameroon, Chad, Kenya, Nigeria, and the Central African Republic. Those are the 10 most diverse nations on earth. And if any of you have seen Tombstone with Doc Holliday, I would just borrow his line where he says, very cosmopolitan. <laughs> Diversity does not make for Copenhagen meets San Francisco necessarily. My point is not to mock these countries. On the contrary, it's to point out what diversity advocates actually mean. What they actually mean is a lot of different races and cultures living happily together in Western countries, under Western legal and property systems, under Western material conditions, under Western secularization, under Western neoliberal political uh, uh, conditions, with Western feminism, Western LGBTQ plus 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 rights, and all the rest. They don't actually mean diversity, they mean a monoculture of the quite homogenous kind 
that they all learned because they all went and had the same values inculcated in, in them at Stanford, Harvard, Yale, Cambridge, Oxford, Sorbonne, London School of Economics, wherever they went. And anyone in the libertarian sphere especially who raises any concerns about mass immigration is of course always met with the same accusation. When we object to the idea of bringing millions, maybe billions of abjectly poor people from global south to north, from third world to first, from bringing Calcutta on an airplane directly into your town, we're right away in quickly labeled a nativist. Any questions about trade-offs in terms of crime or unemployment or welfare or housing are dismissed as evidence of this fearful mindset, unwilling to embrace new arrivals and adapt to change. You know, economic growth is everything rather than amorphous worries about the immigrants' cultural, political, economic, linguistic, religious, or ethnic compatibility. And of course, most of all, this narrative insists that immigration restrictionists are not and cannot, in fact, be well-intentioned people who simply have concerns and hold a different opinion. On the contrary, they are provincial xenophobes, racist, nativists, and even fascists. They resent the demographic inevitability of the decline of Christian dominance across a rapidly secularizing West. They resent the, the coming white minority status in America and Europe. And they are, in effect, people with bad motivations, bad faith actors who just don't like brown people. This is, of course, not an argument. It is a shutdown tactic, and you shouldn't fall for it. I never hear the counter argument made. What if we were to say, let's say we threw open the borders to America, for example. And, and as a result of that, millions and millions of Canadians, Europeans, Australians, and South Africans immediately rushed to take advantage of this new citizenship offering in the United States. And as a result of your open borders policy, America became whiter again, and more Christian. It went from 60% white back up to 75 or 80. And it became more Christian in the process. If that were the case, you wouldn't be for open borders. And the only reason you're for it is because you just don't like white people. I don't hear that argument made too much. I only have a couple minutes left, so I won't go in depth into the economic argument. We've heard this made ad nauseum. Brian Kaplan in his book says, well, the, Open borders would almost just be like picking up trillions of dollars in easy money right off the ground. It would immediately add enormous wealth to the United States because all these people would come here and they would work hard. These empirical debates are best left to social scientists who collect data. I'm deeply suspicious of the data we are given, how it's presented as it relates to the costs and benefits of mass third world immigration. I am a skeptic. But even if they're right, Remember, wealth is subjective. All those trillions of dollars that opens, open borders bring. I wonder if longtime residents in Malmo and Vancouver and Marseille consider themselves trillions richer than 20 or 30 years ago. Remember, we can't measure well-being in aggregates. We can't use GDP or other nonsensical ideas that include government spending and fetishize exports. We can't measure the wealth of a country, but we can know that the new money that comes from, from cheap mass immigration uh, is distributed quite unevenly among the natives, to put it mildly. And this is where we get the criticisms of open borders advocates as shills for wealthy billionaire interests who just want cheap labor and less competition at the top. But even if we accepted the wealth arguments, ladies and gentlemen, what really matters is wealth per capita not just the outcome of a country. China and India produce vastly more output and wealth than Liechtenstein, but somehow no Westerners seem to be clamoring to, to immigrate to China and India. Again, we all want to live in a nice neighborhood writ large. Safety, security, trust, unity, pride, collegiality, the ability of a young child to leave his or her bicycle at the playground and come back and find it two or three days later unmolested. Can we put a price on that? These are not silly trifles for economists to dismiss, and they cannot be measured. My time is up, so I'll conclude with this. The most sensible, humane, and immediately implementable policy is, of course, the Hoppian system of private sponsorship or bonding of immigrants 
immigration only by employers or social welfare groups who accept full liability for the actions or inactions of new arrivals for a set period, perhaps 10 years, no welfare or other benefits, no citizenship or voting with decision making localized and privatized to the greatest extent possible. And either is ni neither closed nor open, but selective borders, privatized immigration rules following Hoppe's full cost principle. As for Hoppophobia, can never be fully eradicated. We, our job is simply to manage it and isolate it like a leper colony. While our ongoing work with the young people, some of whom are here this week, will bear form, will, will bear fruit in the form of better societies, a thousand Lichtensteins, if we are lucky. And as for the immigrants demanding a right to live wherever they wish, even at others' expense, where will they go without our open borders? Paraphrasing the late Murray Rothbard, who cares? Thank you very much.